Hi, everyone, and welcome to this episode of Thriving Through Menopause. And we're going to dig into health, wellness, culture, and a whole load more. And I'm so delighted to have my guest today, Bria Gad. Welcome to the show. Hi, Bria. Hi. <laughs> There's a bit of a glitch there. I'm so sorry. <laughs> That's so okay. Do we do we want to do it again? Yeah. So yeah, no pro no problem. We can just do it again and take cut that bit. So welcome to the show, Bria. Thank you so much, Clarissa. I'm really excited to be here and so honored to connect with you and have this conversation. It's so lovely because you know one of the reasons when I Bria approached me and I went on her Instagram and I thought, oh. She has beautiful energy. I have to have this woman on my show because that's part of it. Isn't just what we do, but how we do it. But I totally Bri agree, and I felt the same about you. So it feels like it was meant to be. Exactly, Bria. You're a, a personal trainer. You're a holistic health coach. You are involved with female hormones. You're passionate about balancing them, and you're also the founder of the Period Whisperer podcast, which I'd love to hear more about, and the P4 formula, which I know we're going to dig into. Yes, absolutely. I'm excited to share it all with you and your listeners today. That is so exciting. But start a bit. How did you get into talking about hormones and being a period whisperer? Thank you. I love that question. So my, I always think about, you know, I'm a mom, but I always think of my first career you know, was really much more in fitness and, and nutrition. So fitness coaching, nutrition coaching. And I started that in, you know, my very early, you know, thirties, late twenties, uh, once both my children were born. Um, and I loved that for me, it was my way of understanding, you know, of carving out time for myself and under, you know, helping other women do the same. But it was around when I was about 35, 36, when I started to hear from some of my clients, like, certain things like, you know, it's not working anymore. Like I'm doing these workouts, I'm feeling really tired, you know, my period's really dragging me down this month. And as a trainer, that gets a little disheartening because you're like, why is, why is this not working? You know, it was always working. And I, I had to take a big step back and I started to do some research into better understanding what was happening. But it wasn't until I was about 37, 38 myself, I'm, I'm 42 now, where I, I started noticing the same thing and, you know, it was, it was a sort of a steady burn into a dark place. I always think where one, I was feeling really tired and fatigued all the time where I could barely get through, you know, the afternoon without major sugar cravings or which I indulged in or a nap where I, or I'd be falling asleep on the couch at seven 30 at night and, and other things started happening. And I did notice some weight gain around my belly, digestive issues for me. And I was beginning to find that I was starting my day with caffeine and ending it with wine to kind of find some joy in my life and get through it. And it was when my sleep started um, disrupting at night, I'd wake up in sweats and I wouldn't, my mind would be racing. I wouldn't be able to fall back to sleep where I thought, oh no, I can't. If I have as a trainer and a coach have these healthy habits, and I'm at that point, 37, 38, if this is as good as it's going to get, I don't know that I can, I, I, I'm looking down the next 40 years of my life. And, and it was a little depressing, which was not my personality. <laughs> uh, and so I went to my doctor, bless her. She's amazing. Like really, a really good, a good practitioner. And she, you know, did the blood work and asked me all the questions. And she looked at me and she said, you know, Bria, you're, you're the picture of health. And, and we think we would be relieved at that, right? I'm so glad I don't have a major issue. And of yeah, course, yeah. I was grateful for that. But it was a little heartbreaking, Clarissa, to be like, I feel like something's wrong. And you're telling me nothing's wrong. Yeah. Oh, wow. And you are so not alone in that feeling. It's mm -hmm. like, you know, women that I work with, that you work, they're just a bit off. You know, yes. something's a bit off. What the heck is going on here, you're thinking? Because yes. nothing shows, but you know, because everything is different. Yes, a hundred percent. And I think culturally for women, one of the hard parts about that is we think, okay, I need to do more. 
I need to work out harder. I need to, you know, be quote unquote better about eating more, better. I need to do all these things in an already very full life. And it kind of works against us, doesn't it? So not only do we become more exhausted and we start to go backwards in a way, but it really impacts our confidence, our self-worth, you know, our ability to think that we can be in any control of our body. And it's it's hard on our psyche. Yeah, very, very hard. And I mean, a, a follow on there is really is why, in your opinion, Bria, are so many people, so many young girl women, because we're not talking about women who are 50. We're talking about women. You were 37. I was, what, 43. Yeah. So why mm -hmm. are so many of us beginning to feel like this? I love that question. And it's in my research now. So I, I dove into a lot of research. I got my um, hormone special, specialization, my gut health specialization. Ultimately, what, what we're not educated on and what we don't understand is that perimenopause, which as you know, is that period of time, kind of like a reverse puberty, where we're going from being reproductively kicking like a brand new car to, you know, to the point where we're not reproducing anymore when we actually achieve menopause. So there's this period of this window. And what's happening is a natural imbalance, of course, in our hormones, which should be for the most part, you know, not amazing, but not life altering. However, what, what exacerbates that imbalance and what makes it cause wreak a lot of havoc on the rest of our systems is any type of stress and inflammation. And I would argue, and what I've seen is that at this stage in life, I mean, I think women have always been full and busy, but we're in this era of time where we can do it all. So we're raising young children still at this age. We're caring for aging parents. We're building peaking careers. We handle still the bulk of what I like to call the emotional labor in a family or a relationship, like, you know, dealing with the PTA and signing the permission forms and organizing the birthday parties and scheduling the dentist, mm -hmm. you know, so all of this is still happening in there. And on top of that, you know, we have obviously exposure to more exposure to toxins, to, you know, technology. And then you layer on two years of, of a very stressful COVID situation. And I think it's become this recipe for like maxing out of stress. Nobody, this kind of hustle addiction, I like to call it. And mm. it's that emphasis on cortisol or that, that spiking our cortisol, which actually really exacerbates that imbalance in our body. And, you know, I'm sure you've already talked about this. I think I've heard about it in some of your podcast episodes, but the two biggest things to understand is that we have this imbalance and anytime we have that cortisol hormone coming in, it fights for the same receptors as our progesterone. Yeah. yeah. And it wins because it's stronger. And so now, and because progesterone and, and estrogen are symbiotic, when there's now not enough progesterone, we have an excess of estrogen, which is, even if it's still coming regularly, can't be managed by the liver. So the liver stores it in as close a place as it can, which is usually our belly, and yep. gets to work on the cortisol and it never gets that break. So we're constantly living in this stress, this state of stress, the state of burnout, yeah. which we had a great episode on recently. Um, and so that is why, and I mean, I would even argue, you know, you think about we are more inundated with social media by how our bodies should be, what it should look yeah. like, what we should yeah. try. And it's very hard for us to hear what's actually happening inside. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I mean, that is a great summation. And it was interesting because somebody coach put it up and she went, oh, women are like this because they're in perimenopause. And I went, I think women are burnt out because they're so stressed yes. and perimenopause is the tipping point. Yes. And she didn't like, she didn't like that because she wanted to blame it all on perimenopause. And I said, God, women are so stressed at this time of life. And you, you really kind of highlighted all the stuff we have going on. And, and we didn't even give ourselves credit for it. No, we don't really. I mean, we don't. And I mean, I read a shocking statistic that we do up to six hours of unpaid work at the end of the day. Oh, God. I mean, God, you know, we come home and insane. We take we take off one uniform and put on the next sort of metaphorically. Absolutely. Hell, you know, and I'm sure you've got two kids. So you do that. Mm hmm. Yep. I do. And, uh, you know, there's now that my kids are sort of in the teenage land, I'm 
relearning this lesson of teach your children, you know, teach a man to fish, that old saying, don't just fish for them and give them the fish. Let's teach them how to do it. So I don't have to do it all. But um, I think you nailed it, Carissa, when you said like it, it really just hot, like perimenopause really just highlights what is already not working for us. But youth is very forgiving. And so like a brand new car, our bodies can kind of like bob and weave and take tight corners and skip an oil change. But we're becoming classics or vintage, as we were talking about earlier. <laughs> we are. We are. Well, we can't. I mean, yeah, just look at our own lives. What were we like at 30? You know, we were out. We were out. We didn't have kids. We didn't have financial issues. Then fast forward to me, what, 15 years later, there I was a single mom with a train wreck of a relationship behind me, you know, working long hours and thinking, oh, my God, every last penny has gone to keep this mortgage going. Yeah, Yeah, more responsibility. And um, it really just sort of, like you said, it's that tipping point because of the workload that the it's added workload in our body of trying to keep ourselves balanced because mm-hmm. the body is always working to move towards that homeostasis, that balance. So now we have this added grind and that's why we start fatiguing. That's why we run out of energy. That's why, you know, everything else starts breaking down because we just don't have the energy we need. Yeah. And that's one of your big things, isn't it? The energy we need. Mm-hmm. So do tell me a bit more about you know, your thoughts and your philosophy around that too. Yeah, absolutely. You know, we all know, like people think willpower is this muscle, but really it's an energy and we run out of it in a day. And any type of new habit, you know, if we if we finally kind of have our dark night of the soul moment or our come to Jesus moment where we look at ourselves in the mirror and we think I need to change, we have... We, often, and I used to be this exact way, okay, here's the 10 things I need to do. And I'm just going to cram these 10 things into my life. I'm not making space for them. I'm not accommodating or, you know, reconciling the fact that we now need more time to do these things. And so then you're just robbing yourself of more energy. And so for me, the pathway back always includes a real understanding of, okay, where's our energy going? And we have to prioritize ourselves during this time. Otherwise, it really will just get worse. Yeah. Yeah. And then we get to what you call hormonal chaos. Hormonal chaos. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it feels like in our body. Because I think the body's really, you know, because it's the thing is, is it's not just, you know, the the typical sex hormones that we're dealing with. It's not, it's not just estrogen and progesterone. And this is why we know it's not because of perimenopause. It becomes an issue of all the other hormones impacted by our endocrine system and our adrenals, you know? And so it becomes, because it is supposed to be, our hormones are really designed, I've heard it described so many times, like a beautiful orchestra. You know, all of a sudden now you yeah. have everything playing when they're not supposed to, and it can go from being this beautiful symphony to pretty rough on the ears. <laughs> I like that, Rhea. Yeah. <laughs> That's sort of pretty yeah. rough on the ears. I mean, and it, 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 ooh, it's all over the place. And you're yeah. right, it isn't just our sex hormones, is it? It's no. a whole host of others. Yeah, Cort- it cortisol and yeah, yeah, everything. You know, we've got yeah the cortisol, the adrenaline. You you know, and then of course the you know some of the other hormones coming into play. But those seem to be the big ones that if we can really begin to create the space and nourish sort of a, a low stress situation, because we can't. I say to my clients all the time, like I can't come in and impact you know how stressful your job is, or maybe your relationship, or even like you know, here, what's so surprising as a Canadian in the U.S., like I just had to, I had to field a text yesterday from my daughter's high school about like a gun and a bomb threat. And I mean, (gasps) I can't, I know it just, Mm. and this is what my, the kids have to, you know, we all have to deal with these things that are very stressless. We can't really necessarily, we can learn to try to manage our stress that way, but there are some key elements of our life where when we know better, we can start to understand how to not add more stress in the areas we can yeah. control. Yeah, and I, and I think that's a really vital message there, Bria, that there are some things you can't control. Mm-hmm. You, you just can't. I mean, that's that's kind of like at the extreme end for me as a European. I'm like, whoa, a gun in, a gun in there at school is like uh, unfathomable. But we can't, we couldn't, ooh, yeah, we couldn't manage COVID. I mean, mm-hmm. 
that just came and sideswiped us. Nobody could yeah. expect that. And I think we're still feeling, I, I don't know in the US, but I still think people are feeling the fallout. Women are still experiencing the fallout from that. Absolutely. The ripple effect, I think, you know, or that butterfly effect we call, I mean, we I don't think we even begin to understand what it is yet. Well, people will study it in two decades, you know, from now <laughs> looking back. So it's, it's yeah. Important. And I think the hardest part for women, you know, it's, it's, I, I think one of the most, the hardest part, but then the most empowering is that menopause and perimenopause, it's not something that happens entirely to you. It, it does happen somewhat like the suffering of it, the hormonal chaos of it, which is what causes these really insufferable um, symptoms really is kind of happening because of you. We can control, which the empowering piece is that we can control an element of it. And then should we need support after that, you know, we have that in place, but we have to really understand first how the female body is working and how to kind of get out of its own way. And I always think one of my favorite quotes that I learned early on was, if given half a chance, the body can heal itself. And it, and it yeah. really can as long as we get out of its way. Yeah. I, and I love that because, you know, my background is Chinese medicine. We believe that people can heal ourselves. Our whole journey is to let people heal themselves and empower them. I mean, not all Chinese medicine is acupuncture and even that is facilitating self-healing. And you know, I think that we're in a world now where women are being told you can be fixed by medication. And I don't know where you sit on that because we haven't had that conversation. But, you know, this is, I think, a message I see coming very strongly out of the UK. Mm -hmm. That's fine. We can fix you. Take HRT. You'll be fine. And then <laughs> here in the US, too. And I, I think, you know, for me, my feeling like, if it fixed people, then I don't think we would be in this situation. I do think there's, you know, there's always a time and place, you know, to help people get over humps or, you know, and, and certainly some conditions and situations, but it all becomes a little bit irrelevant. If we don't create that foundation of health first, then you'll always have to take it. And eventually it won't work very well anymore. So regardless of where you stand on, whether it's, you know, you want that or not, it doesn't change the fact that like, for example, someone who might need to go on antidepressants, it doesn't change that they really should also go to therapy to heal the underlying cause. Yeah. And that's where I think the holistic side of this can come into play, because we don't get something for nothing in life. If you're going to take a pill, you're going to pay the piper for that somewhere along your journey. Yeah. And I think sometimes that's not clearly said enough. Mm -hmm. And the um, holistic side of it gets kind of be a bit of a throwaway line. Yes. but you know, you're, you're a holistic health coach, you know, how do women start to heal from a holistic perspective? Yes, I love that. So this is where I kind of created this P4 formula. So I think it kind of comes into four different spots. And, and the first P I call is like permission to prioritize ourself. Um, and I think that's, you know, when people are showing up and listening to your podcast or my podcast, to me, that's the beginning of them accepting that things can be different, you know, because culturally, we're really taught that menopause is just something we have to deal with, that you're going to have hot flashes, you're going to be moody, you know, not very nice to be around. And that's, that's what we're taught. <laughs> that's what we see. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, television. Um, and then it's just also not even something that's talked about. So just having this conversation, recognizing that you don't have to feel this way and starting to educate yourself on that is that really that first step in that permission to prioritize yourself. And I think one of my favorite ways to do that is, you know, every day when I get up, I like to carve out just 10 minutes a day to listen to a podcast or an audible book that's reminding me of this simple fact that I shouldn't feel this is what I'm going through. What can I do about it? Um, cause otherwise we forget. Yeah, we forget. And, and, and I think, you know, we only have to say to women, uh, show me your to-do list and where are you on that list? Yes. <laughs> they don't know where I don't know where on that list for, for you. Or they're, or they're number 10 and, and nothing ever happens, you know, it's <laughs> a really good point. And, and yet how we even start our day or that beginning of the to, to do list oh. really impacts the rest of our day. Yeah. My, my, uh, my Qigong teacher, who's a very wise older man says, you know, 
in that you don't if you don't do your practice then the day will rust run you you know i think mm. he said it better than that but he said you know if you don't get up and deliberately do your qigong practice 10 minutes 20 minutes you know or longer it never happens it becomes yeah. something you promise yourself to do yeah. and then by seven o'clock eight o'clock you get and think about oh it's time to go to bed oh i never did that yeah it just yeah. never happened happened and now I don't feel like it and now I don't have time and yet had you done it in the beginning maybe your whole day would have been a little bit more calm a little bit more like purposeful exactly. and you may have had more space or at least felt better about it all yeah but after prioritize what comes next yeah. in the 4p <laughs> right. so like daily cadence of prioritization and, and just having that conversation and then the next p is about um like prioritizing in you know inflammation inflammation reduction. So making sure that the habits of our four key aspects of life, which we sort of have these four pillars of health. I, I look at it this way, where if you imagine our health is a table with four legs, you know, we have movement, we have nutrition, we have sleep, and we have pleasure. Or, or, and if any one of these are rickety, if one's rickety, okay, it's going to be an uncomfortable dining experience. If two are, I mean, it's hard to eat. And if three are, like the meal's not standing on the table. And that's a real, for me, that's always been a good analogy of our health. Like we have to be constantly checking in with these four health pillars. And for, for so sleep wise, I mean, creating at least that bedtime routine, of course, because the bedtime routine is what's going to allow us to have the good morning routine, which as we just discussed is yeah. important. Um, yeah. People don't always realize like 97% of people need seven to nine hours of sleep. And if our yeah. sleep is disrupted right now, it just needs to still be a priority that we're there, that we're fostering anti-inflammatory habits, like not staring at screens as we fall asleep and maybe just pulling out a good old book and crawling into bed for a little bit. So that bedtime routine and that sleep window is really important. When it comes to movement, I think, you know, as a trainer, I always like to remind people that like fitness is is a luxury. It's not something that all bodies need. You, I realize as we age resistance training, there's some value in those things, but movement is what's important for health. And by yeah. that, I mean like walking for 30 minutes a day, you know, again, a Qigong practice, yoga, something that's expansive that doesn't add stress to the body because yeah. any type of resistance training, high intensity interval training, cardiovascular training, asks of the body. So now we're already in, a, in an imbalance and now we're asking more of an already stressed <laughs> yeah. body and yeah. it, it'll backfire. Yeah. And I think it's interesting that that's been the push now, the big push of re resistance training, resistance training, resistance training. And I feel that that's drowning out the the yoga, the qigong, the walking. I mean, I had some woman on social media tell me that a dog walk wasn't, you know, any form of exercise. And I said, I'll lend, I'll lend you my dog. I said, she's 18 <laughs> kilos of full on Springer Spaniel. And I said, you know, she just goes like a bullet. And I said, yeah. you wanna, you wanna have some exercise? Oh, she's there, bear with a little tail behind me now. <laughs> yeah, she, she's sweet, and she is like. Yeah, and yeah. she's strong and she pulls all there she is. <laughs> you know, so so she's she's been my lifeline through mm -hmm. COVID. I got out because I have to go out with her. Yeah. And, yeah. It's, and it's one of the beautiful parts of having a dog, isn't it? That they, you know, oh. they get you outside in all the weather and you can yeah. There's a couple things, but the one like walking creates a nice focused breath. And yeah. there are studies that are showing that even just conscious breathing 15 minutes a day will reduce hormone imbalance by 47%, which yeah. is a crazy stat to me. But I, when I was in my hormonal chaos and, and try, you know, it was a hard mind piece to wrap myself around, but I moved from doing six hard workouts a week to only yoga and walking and I lost 15 pounds in, in over four months because of yeah. that. You know, people, yeah. And it's, it's simply because the body needs to rest. And when you're yeah. adding more and asking more, it's going to, it needs more. So it will ask for more food. It'll ask for more energy. And, and then it can't even handle it all because it's already busy. Well, that's true. That that's a really good point that it's already busy. And 
you know, you're hearing these women who want to hit train every day. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's exhaust. That's exhausting. And you see these programs sixty days in a row. And I, yeah. and I, I mean, I don't do this. I mean, I look at them and I think, well, I can do maybe one or two of those a week. Or women lifting more than their own body weights, and I just go, I'm not, sh I'm not convinced. I mean, I, I know that muscle, and obviously we know that there is there's sarcopenia going on, mm -hmm. but. But you can do a lot with Pilates and yoga. Yes, this is this is an important conversation. I agree because I think one before we ask more of our bodies, we need to make sure again those pieces are in place. Because if you're not sleeping seven to nine hours, you can't recover. If you don't have the yeah. right nutrition, you can't recover. So you're kind of yeah. just wasting your time. <laughs> oh, you're and making yourself more tired, and you're in more yeah. hormone chaos. Absolutely. Absolutely. Best case scenario, you're wasting your time. Worst case, it's really <laughs> wreaking havoc. And, yeah. you know, I think it's just the other piece I always say to people, especially when they're healing this element of themselves is if you if you love fitness, if it's your hobby, fine, let's do it a couple times a week and recognize that joy and pleasure does help to reduce. But it really should be something that you're doing because you love it not because yeah. we're supposed to. Exactly. And mm -hmm. and going on from there, we've had prioritizing yes. and then obviously <laughs> there. No, but let's go to yeah. the third P because yes. that's yes. such great. Um, and of course, in that prioritizing inflammation is, you know, there's of course nutrition. So understanding which foods are, you know, reducing that inflammation. And then there's pleasure. People, you know, underestimate the value of that pleasure. But um, the third P is really... Um, more around like prior like perspective i always say like our, it can be very i think perspective plays such a big role and if we expect that menopause and perimenopause is going to suck then it it can it's just a lot of our mindset there so i think women forget often not everyone's in a hetero relationship but if you're in a hetero relationship with kids i mean you're the only one going through this so we're now not around anyone experiencing it yeah. and then if you are, you know, a lot of our friends, we don't really talk about it. I think one, because it's just culturally not something we talk about. And two, because we're just so happy to finally see our friends that we don't want to talk about all of our woes when we're together. <laughs> right? so, so yeah. When we, when we have this perspective over, okay, I should feel really great. You know, I, I have to, I'm going to climb this mountain of menopause, whatever it looks like, but I can climb this mountain with terrible tools, I can climb it with great tools. And my perspective can be, oh my gosh, this is going to be so awful. It's going to be so yeah. hard. I don't want to do yeah. this. It's going to be cold. It's going to be, or we can say, wow, like think about the people I'm going to meet along the way. Look at the views I'm going to get to see. Think about how much stronger the process is going to be. And what am I going to get to experience? Yeah. I and think that's really interesting that, mm -hmm. that because the narrative in social media is so negative. It's like we've taken the most negative stories we can find and they then have become the conversation. Mm -hmm. And I think that when women say something different, mm -hmm. they get shouted down now. Yes, absolutely. You're right. And I think we need, that's part of the value of these conversations we get to have is really just, you know, reminding people that this is an open conversation, it's an important conversation. And the more yeah. we normalize it, I think the less it'll happen to be careful. Yeah. And it's not to invalidate if you've had a really tough time. It doesn't invalidate those people. But similarly, we don't want to invalidate people who say, well, actually, I didn't have a really tough time. Mm -hmm. You know, it kind of, it just kind of happened. And, and, and that was it. And there's a few people who said, well, I had some really bad moments and bad months or even a couple of bad years in there. And they kind of came and went and came and went yes. because yeah. everybody's experience is valid, but you're right. Mindset. If you think it's going to be bad, it's going to be bad. <laughs> you've yes. got to feel it. Yep. Absolutely. Abs you're absolutely right. And so you, you want to, it's not just about choosing to wake up and being positive. It's about also surrounding yourself with people who feel that way. You know, I heard a stat recently that was, it's not our family that often will dictate who we are and how we feel in our body. It's, it's the people we spend our most time with. So 80% of people who are unhealthy and unhappy in their bodies are surrounded by those people too. So we do need to be conscious about how we're educating ourselves, what content's coming in every day, who we're hanging out yeah. with. 
Yeah. All of it. It's the whole thing. The whole thing. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Some somebody in the in Australia once said you don't pee in your own swimming pool, you know, you keep you keep all the toxic yeah, only in Aussie would say something like that. She said it worse than that, but I won't say that on the show. But you know, if you keep filling your world with things that are toxic yeah. and negative, that's what you show up like. Yes, I completely agree with you. So that perspective is so important. And then the last P is really around, um, you know, that conscious time to check in with ourselves. So mm -hmm. making sure we're prioritizing time to check in with our body, because I think we've been taught culturally to really look outside of ourselves for answers. Yeah. And of course, when we're in a hormonal chaos, it's really hard because we can't even hear what our body is actually saying to us. But we've been taught you know, through messaging like hustle harder, we've been taught to, even though we're tired, push through, you know, yeah. we've been taught to, if we're tired, have caffeine. We've been, you know, these things that really don't serve and they're not even the messaging that we need. If you're tired, we should rest, you know, if, yeah. you're, if your muscles and joints are sore after a workout, you should not do another workout. You know, there's, there's messaging that we miss by, by looking outside, when we start to really tune in to, okay, how am I feeling? What is my body? What is she really talking to? And I think yeah. that's where self love really happens because you're giving respect to your body. And when you meet work together in, in fulfilling those needs, that's when the body can exhale and say, okay, we're on the same team now. And I can release this. I can, you know, get back to functioning properly because you're not making this harder on me anymore. No. And I think rest is, you know, I had Karen Brody in here. She's the queen of rest. I think in the, yeah. And she's just like, be a rest rebel, you know, yeah. this is, oh, no. <laughs> you know, but she's so right. You know, you have to say I can rest, but it's yeah. one of the hardest things. Our culture does not uh, yes. look at that function mm -hmm. like that. It's a, it, it, can it sort of judges you and says well you're tired and you're lazy and you should be doing yes. not being and and we have this voice now in our head that says the same thing and that's one of the most challenging parts for us isn't it is that we can't seem to we need to learn to quiet that voice and yeah. recognize that much like i think of it like olympians are obviously the best athletes are the best at their game in the world but olympians have they they're asking olympic levels of themselves but they have a very clear you know off season a very clear physical health season oh, like stretching yes. massage downtime right? like it's built in oh and yeah we're here asking olympic levels of output of ourselves but no one's treating us like we're not treating ourselves like an olympian that way no and that we can do that no one can do that for us yes. there yeah. is no prescription for the conscious awareness only you can do that i can teach you the tools you can teach your people the tools but at the mm -hmm. end of the day we have to do them and practice them and live them and that that's the change yes yes and and more often than not that i found in myself in my own story but in in my clients is we we hustle as a numbing addiction. So when we're uncomfortable, oh, yeah. when something's hard, when we don't know what else to do, instead of sitting in it and processing it, we try to do more to overcompensate. And often, you know, people don't want to do yoga because what's coming up in your mind when you're <laughs> trying to be still, things you don't want to think about, but unfortunately need to, which is where yeah. I think, you know, we can't underestimate the fact that in perimenopause, there is that sort of emotional side where if there's things coming up that maybe you truly need to set a boundary around, or you haven't been, been felt very good about, you're creating resentment on, you know, in a relationship or in others. Now's the time your body's kind of saying, I'm not going away. You need to look at this now. Yeah. Yeah. And address it and address it as best as you can. Yes. And I think that's when we start to start thinking things like, is this job really right for me? Is this person I'm with, is it working? Is it not? Doesn't mean you have to ditch your partner, but it means you might have to talk about things that you don't talk about. Yep, absolutely, and and do the hard parts. But often, hard effort comes with great payoff. I think, and you know, I think ultimately that is what our body is saying to us at this age. It's like, no, it's time. 
it's time it's to definitely heal. time. Yeah. So there is there is so much great stuff there to heal, yeah. Bria. Yeah. I mean, if you had one top tip for women, what would that be to start this journey? Hmm. Oh, um, I think one of like the actual of, of a tangible thing that we can do every day is to wake up and do not start your day with coffee. You know, start your day with something that actually nourishes the struggle that's going on. So for me, I like a mind, body, soul situation where I will either have just, you know, a cup of warm water with lemon because that lemon really helps the liver, which is important right now. Mm -hmm. And I will go for a walk and I will either be with my own thoughts or I will listen to your podcast or someone else's podcast that again, yeah. sets me back on the path of, okay, I am, I can heal my body because you know, really remembering that how much control we have and how great we should feel and how great it is to feel great is an important daily habit that we have to create. So yeah. for me, that's what I would say is wake up and start this habit of moving your body for even just 10 minutes, listen to something that fuels your mind and and just don't start your day with something that is going to skyrocket the cortisol. That's what we're trying to move away from. <laughs> you can have breakfast <laughs> later. I get it. I like coffee. You can have it yeah. later, but let's start with a little calming piece. Oh, that is that is best advice I think yeah. that people can take away with them. Bria, you just have so much energy and passion around this. How can people who've been listening to this podcast here, learn more about you and the work you do. Where can they find you? Thank you so much, Clarissa. Yes. Yeah, so you can find me again on all the podcast places as well, iTunes and Spotify at the Period Whisperer podcast, which is really about learning to hear the whispers of your body that's happening so we don't ignore them anymore and how to do that. You can find me on Instagram at Bria underscore period underscore whisperer um, or my website, Bria the period whisperer.com. You can find me on any of those places to continue the conversation and, and stay present here. But uh, I, I'm so grateful, Clarissa, for this opportunity. I love what you do. We're so lucky to have you out spreading this message and having this conversation. Well, likewise, likewise. And guys, those things are all going to be down here below in the show notes. So check them out. Follow Bria on Instagram and be inspired. I'm so grateful that you came here. I Thank love talking to you. Thank you. We'll do it again. Thank you so much. We will.